This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our viewers and listeners uh, around the country and around the world. Millions of students are expected to walk out of class on Friday in a global climate strike. Here in New York, school authorities have announced students will be allowed to miss classes without facing any penalties in order to, to participate in the protest. With 1.1 million students, New York City has the largest school system in the country. The student climate strike is taking place three days before the United Nations Climate Action Summit. Well, today we spend the hour with Naomi Klein, who's just out with a new book. It's called On Fire, The Burning Case for a Green New Deal. Naomi Klein is senior correspondent at The Intercept and the inaugural Gloria Steinem Chair of Media, Culture and Feminist Studies at Rutgers University. In a moment, she'll join us here in our studio. But first, we turn to a new video featuring Naomi Klein. It was just released by The Intercept. It's titled, What's in a Trump Straw? I do think we have bigger problems than plastic straws. Even a busted clock is right twice a day. And so it is with the Trump straw. Well, most political campaigns sell tacky T-shirts that nobody wants. What is Trump campaign selling? An attitude in the form of recyclable plastic straws. The president of the United States is a terrible businessman. But it's time to admit that for once, he has a certifiable hit on his hands. The first batch of 140,000 sold out. That's 200 grand in sales. Sales of these bits of plastic, proudly advertised on his campaign website as nine inches long and modeled in the mouth of an adorable young girl, ew, show no signs of slowing down. The marketing approach is not exactly mysterious. Liberal paper straws don't work. Plastic ones do, especially <laughs> when they've got Trump it's written true. on the side. The fast food president, for his part, We have pizzas, we have 300 hamburgers, many, many french fries. Seems genuinely confused. You have a little straw. But what about the plates, the wrappers, and everything else that are much bigger? But I think there's more that the success of the Trump straw can tell us. In fact, if you squint, it's kind of a portal, a long, skinny one. These overpriced bits of pre-landfill actually tell us a whole lot about why our planet is on fire. The Amazon is burning. Brazil's president, Jair Bolsonaro, encouraged deforestation of the Amazon. And why, in country after country, it's the arsonists who are in charge. This is coal. Don't be afraid. Don't be we have ended the war on American energy, and we have ended the war on beautiful, clean coal. They might even tell us something about how we can put out the flames. Bear with me. I've spent the past 15 years trying to figure out why so many of us aren't acting like our house is on fire when it clearly is. And I've looked at all the theories. Our brains aren't wired for distant threats. Stopping climate change is too expensive. The technology just isn't there yet. Politicians only think short term. You've heard all the theories. But I think it's actually the Trump straw that does the best job of explaining this. What we are witnessing is a temper tantrum against the merest suggestion that there are limits to what we can consume, to what we can extract from nature, and to the garbage we can dump back into it. It's no surprise that the backlash is strongest in places like the US and Brazil. Just think of how they were founded. Europe was hitting up against nature's limits. They'd overfished their rivers, felled their great forests, and hunted their big game. When European conquerors stumbled upon the so-called New World, they thought they'd hit the jackpot. They saw in the Americas a kind of supersized Europe that would never run out of fish, trees, gold, fur, or any of that bounty. Here were whole spare countries, New England, New France, New Spain, New Amsterdam. They weren't very imaginative. America, industrial miracle of the century. From all the states flow bounteously the products of forest, mine, and field. The point is that the very promise, the official story of our countries, is a story of endless nature, wilderness to be devoured without limits. And the indigenous people who stood in the way, who had very different ideas about land and nature, they had to be removed at all costs. 
And so now, when an ecological crisis comes along and says, whoa, actually, we filled our oceans with plastic, our skies with heat trapping gases, and we actually have to live within limits. It's not just hard for the people most invested in these stories. It's seen as an existential attack. They want to take your pickup truck. They want to rebuild your home. They want to take away your hamburgers. It's how a paper straw can become a threat to an entire way of life. The ultimate trigger sculpture. It has everything the Democrats hate. Steak, plastic straws, and light bulbs. Look. It's easy to dismiss all this as the infantile worldview of Trump supporters who just can't wrap their heads around the climate crisis. But the truth is that a lot of liberals are trapped in a pretty similar ideology, one that can imagine anything except limits to growth and consumption, which might be why some of them feel an overwhelming need to publicly express their fealty to cheeseburgers. First of all, I'm from Indiana, and secondly, I love cheeseburgers. Just to be very honest with you, I love cheeseburgers. I am uh, hopeful uh, that we're going to be able to do this in a way, uh, especially when I'm president, that we can continue uh, to have hamburgers and cheese. And in a way, the straw wars offer a portal into that mindset as well. So many environmental responses have just been minor tweaks to an economy based on endless consumption. Take your electric car to the drive through for an impossible burger and a Coke with a paper straw. Look, of course it's better than the alternative, but it's nowhere close to the depth of change required if we hope to actually pull our planet back from the brink. Restricting plastic straws is great, but we also need a ban on those significantly larger cylindrical sucking things. And electric cars, they're nice if you can afford them, but what we really need is free, zero emissions, public transit with energy efficient, non-market housing and healthcare steps away. But those policies would mean tossing out the market-friendly centrist religion of the past half century and massively investing in the public sphere to create millions of good union jobs. In other words, a Green New Deal. Because we are limited by the laws of nature, by what our planet can and cannot take. But when it comes to the laws that we make, the rules governing our economy and our society, there can be no limits to what we're willing to do to save our future. We need new ways of thinking beyond Trumpian temper tantrums or the dangerous incrementalism of the supposedly serious center. Because our house is on fire and straws aren't going to cut it. It's time to grab a fire hose. Naomi Klein, the renowned author, award-winning journalist and activist, speaking in a new video from The Intercept. Well, as millions of students prepare to walk out of class on Friday in a global climate strike, we spend the rest of the hour with Naomi Klein. She's out today with a new book titled On Fire, The Burning Case for a Green New Deal. A book reviewer in The New York Times wrote in today's paper, quote, If I were a rich man, I'd buy 245 million copies of Naomi Klein's On Fire and hand-deliver them to every eligible voter in America, he said. Well, Naomi Klein, welcome back to Democracy Now! Congratulations on this day, the publication date of your book. Thank it's you, called Amy. On Fire, a burning case, the burning case for a Green New Deal. Um, people throw around that term. Certainly, the candidates are talking about it um, across the political spectrum, whether they're for it or against it. What to you is the Green New Deal, and what is the crisis that we are facing? Uh, well, first of all, it's great to be with you, Amy and Juan. Um, it is true that the Green New Deal is become something of a of a, of a bumper sticker slogan, uh, and it's um, misrepresented on Fox more than it is accurate or accurately represented in in the uh, so-called liberal media. So there's a lot of confusion about what this means. But I think fundamentally, um, it is a transformational approach to the climate crisis uh, that is on the scale of the crisis itself that says that the actions we take have to be 
guided by science, and scientists are telling us that we need uh, to cut emissions globally in half in a mere 11 years. Um, but it isn't a single carbon-based policy, like a tax, uh, you know, or cap-and-trade. It's really about transforming the economy. Uh, and making it fairer, right? So it's battling poverty, it's battling uh, racism, it's battling all forms of inequality and exclusion at the same time as we radically lower our emissions. Because we do know that if we are going to lower our emissions in time, it is going to take transformations of how we live in cities, how we move ourselves around, how we grow our food, where we get our energy from. So essentially what the Green New Deal is saying, if we're going to do all that, why wouldn't we, why wouldn't we tackle all of these systemic, economic, and social crises at the same time, because we live in a time of multiple overlapping crises. Well, one of the things you uh, you point out, uh, Naomi, is first of all, the critics are calling the Green New Deal uh, uh, insanely uh, ambitious and uh, prohibitively expensive to the American economy and to, and to other nations as well. But you point out that it, in the past, uh, there have been instances when the United States government has marshaled enormous of, of forces and money to deal with uh, problems. You, you talk about the original New Deal under FDR, and you talk about the Marshall Plan uh, after World War II both of which were attempt, attempts by, some would say, enlightened capitalists to deal with the fact that their, the countries, uh, Europe, after World War II and the U.S., were heading toward potential revolution, and that right. they, they had to respond to the popular movements by making radical investments and change. You talk about that further. Well, absolutely. You know, I've been writing about uh, the climate crisis for more than a decade and, and really trying to understand why it is that despite all of the scientific warnings, despite the, the, the fact that, sure, it's expensive to deal with the crisis, but we know how, uh, how not, not just expensive, but, but, but just the devastating human costs in action carry. You know, why have we talked and talked, our governments, have, why have we, they've been talking for more than 30 years about lowering emissions while global emissions have gone up by 40 percent? And one of the reasons is that this crisis landed on our laps a, as a species at the worst possible moment in, in human evolution, that, that a collective crisis of this nature could have landed on their laps, on, on, in our laps, which is the late 1980s, the high point of the sort of free market zealotry, um, you know, right when the Berlin Wall is collapsing, right when history is being declared over, right, you know, when Margaret Thatcher is saying there is no alternative, there is no such thing as society. Th this was a huge problem, because here we're being told that um, really, we can't do anything collectively. We have to scale back our collective action. We have to cut existing government programs. We have to privatize everything. Um, when here we're facing a crisis that requires unprecedented collective action, unprecedented collective investment, and yet we're handing the tools over to private for-profit companies, whether it's water, whether it's electricity, whether it's transportation. So I think the real value of uh, really calling it a Green New Deal and hearkening back to an earlier age, which remi it reminds us, actually, it is possible to deal with collective crises. There's so much fatalism and doomsaying right now that is really uh, making these appeals to human nature. Of course, Jonathan Franzen is the, is the mo highest profile, most recent example. But, but we hear this argument all the time. Humans can't do something on this scale. Humans are incapable of, you know, doing anything but just sort of satisfying our basest, most immediate interests. Um, and so people hear this. They hear that this is all we are. And so they feel hopeless, right? Um, and so I think the important, uh, what is important about reminding ourselves, okay, well, in the face of, of, of the Great Depression, in the face of the deepest economic crisis this country has ever faced, there was this, there was huge collective action. Um, and you know whether it was uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, planting 2.3 billion trees, um, setting up hundreds of camps across the country, um, tackling soil erosion, um, 800 new state parks, um, whether it's hundreds of thousands of new works of art during, the, the, during the, the original New Deal, or, as you said, Juan, the Marshall Plan, which reminds us of another uh, time of collective action. You know, as you said, it wasn't just governments handing down these programs from on high out of the goodness of their hearts. It was the push and pull of 
social strife, strikes, militant action, rising socialism, and, and this came to be seen as a compromise. Um, we need to remember this history because it reminds us that this thing called human nature that gets evoked, telling us that we are doomed, um, is not fixed. Humans are many things, um, and we have been different in the past, and we can be different again. Naomi Klein, you use the term climate barbarism. Explain. Um, well, I, I use that term to describe the fact that, you know, we, we, we often talk about governments like the Trump administration as governments that are committed to climate change denial. Um, I don't think they deny the reality of climate change. I mean, Donald Trump has had to adapt the construction of his golf courses because of rising sea level. They all know it's happening. Um, but they think they're going to be all right. They think their families are going to be all right. They think wealthier countries are going to be all right. And these governments are adapting to climate change. They may not be adapting the way the United Nations would like them to adapt, by cutting emissions, by uh, by, by building you know, seawalls, whatever it is. They're building border walls. They're, they are adapting um, through this unleashing of white supremacist ideology and creating the intellectual rationale for allowing millions of people to die. I mean, that's what I mean by climate barbarism. We are already seeing many thousands of people being allowed to die in the Mediterranean. Um, it, it, we're seeing people left in migrant detention facilities that are, are a lot like concentration camps, whether it's offshore uh, camps uh, set up by the Australian government, whether it's the European Union sending people to the Libyan camps, uh, and now the Trump administration setting up its own camps. Um, this is, I think, should be understood as a kind of climate change adaptation. This is what how they are proposing to deal with a world in which millions of people are being forced from their homelands. We already know, just yesterday, from the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, that seven million people in the first six months of 2019 have been forced to move because of uh, floods, droughts, um, disasters, many of them linked to cl the climate crisis. And speaking of, of, of uh, some of these disasters, uh, one, one of the particularly powerful essays uh, in this book, and it should be clear, this is a collection of essays that you've written over about a 10-year period mm -hmm. on the issue of the climate. Uh, it's titled A Season of Smoke, and mm -hmm. you talk about you're going back to your family's uh, home place in, in uh, uh, in British Columbia for uh, your regular summer vacation in, in 2017, mm -hmm. and you were stunned by the changes that were occurring all around you as a result of all of the wildfires that were engulfing the western parts of the United States and Canada. I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you could talk further about that. Yeah, so that essay is an attempt to sort of capture the, I guess, the re relentlessness of some of the ways in which the climate crisis plays out, because Obviously, it is these sort of acute disasters, these record-breaking storms and uh, uh, that, that capture our attention, as well they should. But I think part of the reason why we're seeing a shift in uh, polling around, around the climate crisis, uh, and we are seeing a shift in the United States, where not only do, are more people understanding that, yes, it is real, yes, humans are causing it, but um, people are ranking concern for climate change as their, you know, their, their number one or number two concern. There's a real sense of urgency. And I think the biggest reason for that is simply that so many people's lives are touched by it, um, by storms, by flood, by drought. But, but smoke impacts huge numbers of people. So even if you aren't um, right by the wildfire and having to evacuate, for the past, um, you know, several summers in the Pacific Northwest, and the one I write about is was, was 2017, but it was also true of 2018, um, the entire region was just enveloped in, in, in smoke uh, for, you know, well over a month. And you had this sort of, you know, impacts on respiratory health um, and just this sense of profound unease, which is what I was trying to capture in, in that essay of just this general kind of, what, like, the sun and the moon looking so very strange, these little red or orange dots in the sky. Um, and, of course, the inequalities that, that, that always accompany this. So the, 
migrant fruit pickers, for instance, across the border in Washington state, um, were having to pick fruit in these horrific conditions. And, and, and they're not good to begin with, right? Um, and as workers collapsed on the job, they were just sent home, at, like, as, like, defective goods. Uh, so, you know, part of what I'm exploring in that essay, of course, is what the U.N. is now calling climate apartheid, where you have this extreme inequality of impacts.